Wellspring Church of All Nations presents Screams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stokes. dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and joys of a fulfilling, abundant, spirit-filled, and spirit-led life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God speaks. Does anybody listen? What did he just say to us? What does it mean? I think that we probably need to recognize that God's doing some different things now and we want to be prepared for those things and many things try to keep us from moving with the spirit and moving with the Lord but we're not going to allow it are we we're going to consider what he says we're going to confirm it with the word we're going to look over it and consider what it means to us individually and to the church, and to our communities and our nations. Because if anything, we need God to move in this hour. Amen. We need the moving of the Holy Spirit, the salvation of souls, to change our nation one soul at a time. Well, tonight I wanted to talk to you about the evening of the first day. Pastor talked about the morning of the first day but I had this thought that many times we think that the supernatural for the people of God only began in the book of Acts but I want to present to you that on the day of resurrection the supernatural began to happen as God was showing forth his power in his church. So it wasn't like, yay, Jesus was raised from the dead, let's all go home and have dinner. And that was the end of it, till Pentecost. But that's not true. It's not a PS or a post note on the resurrection. It is a continuation of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Let's go to Mark. Pastor had us in Mark this morning. He gave us verses 1 through 8. And tonight, we're going to start with verse 9. Since that was read this morning. If you weren't here this morning, you can read it yourself, and then you can uh, catch up. Verse 9. Now Jesus, having risen from death early on the first day of the week, appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had driven out seven demons. She went and reported it to those who had been with him, as they grieved and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Okay. After this, he reappeared in a different form, to two of them as they were walking along the way into the country. And they returned to Jerusalem and told the others, but they did not believe them either. Afterward, he appeared to the eleven apostles themselves as they reclined at table, and he reproved and reproached them for their unbelief, their lack of faith, and their hardness of heart, because they had refused to believe those who had seen him and looked at him attentively after he had risen from the dead. It 
it's interesting, and I think it's the same today. I think it was the same then. I think it until uh, Jesus returns. It's pretty much the same that we have this challenge with. It's the same as the, the word of God coming forth by tongues and interpretation of tongues, prophecy. And we hear it, but I can guarantee you, within 10 minutes you'll have forgotten what it said. Because the mind is an enmity with the Spirit of God. And so our mind can't capture it like it should. We need to train ourselves to capture that word and then be able to hold on to it that we can look at it at another time and begin to nurture it in our uh, mind, will, and emotions. And so we see these. Now, these were the men that walked with Jesus and they are so, or we are so like them, because Jesus was risen from the dead. Something happened, something definitely happened, and all they can do is not believe it. And have you ever had it in your life where God did some miracle <clears throat> and you said, I can't believe that? Haven't you said that? I think we've all said that at one time or another. Something miraculous happens. And we lose track of the fact that, wow, God did something miraculous. It's like, I don't believe this happened. I don't believe this happened. What great people of faith are we? We don't believe it when we see it. And here we have the same startling kind of picture, the same challenge, the unbelief, the confusion, the nonsense that goes on as we struggle to apprehend and to comprehend that of the Spirit that we may have seen with our own eyes, but we still cannot believe it. How frustrating for those who came and told that they had seen him to bring the news back and have nobody believe them. Do you think that was frustrating? I would be totally frustrating. They had something great, and nobody could get it because they didn't believe it. And unbelief has been a challenge. It is, was a challenge to the nation of Israel from their conception, actually, from the time that God chose them. When God called Abraham out of the Ur of the Chaldees, unbelief was a problem even then. And we would say, oh, if I could have been with Abraham. Oh, if I could have been with Jesus. Oh, if I could have been with Elijah. Oh, but it's the same thing. You would see it, you would hear it, but you probably wouldn't believe it. And it's something we need to struggle with. We really do need to struggle with it and overcome it. Now, let's look at Luke 24. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 24, we're going to go through this particular chapter expositorily. So I'll read a few verses, and then we'll, we'll comment and, and think about what it says. But starting from with verses 1 through 12, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices which they had made ready. And they found the stone rolled back from the tomb. And when they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed and wondering what to do about this, Behold, two men in dazzling raiment stood beside them. And as the women were frightened and were bowing their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Now, we know that Jesus told his disciples and his followers that he would be risen from the dead. We know that, don't we? We know that he demonstrated a type of resurrection with Lazarus and with the son of the woman who was being carried out in the funeral procession. Uh, so we know that they saw these things, but they couldn't put it together in their mind. And so it comes along. These are angels, these men in bright raiment, and it says, he's not here, he is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. 
that the Son of Man must be given over to the hands of sinful men, men whose way or nature is to act in opposition to God, to be crucified and on the third day rise from the dead. Well, also the Old Testament, Psalm 1610, speaks of the same thing. It wasn't a new concept. It was just something they couldn't believe it. They just couldn't believe it. And they remembered his words, verse 8 says, and having returned from the tomb, they reported all these things taken together to the 11 apostles and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who reported these things to the apostles. But these reports seemed to the men an idle tale, madness, feigned things, nonsense. They did not believe the women. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, and stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen cloths alone by themselves. And he went away wondering about and marveling at what must have happened. So we can see here he told them in verse 7. They remembered his words in verse 8. But by the time the reports began coming in, they could not believe it. They just could not believe it. It was like a, a, an idle tale. They could not connect it in their reality. And so much of what God has done, is doing, and will do is like that to us. We're very much like these people. That we just, we think about it, and yet God knows. He said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. Well, that means that we still don't believe it. He's trying to encourage us to get our heads on here and recognize there are greater things than we have ever seen and heard up until this hour. So starting with verse 13, we're going to examine this little uh, meeting of the two men on the road to Emmaus. And behold, that very day, two of the disciples were going to a village called Emmaus, which is about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had occurred as they walked. And while they were conversing and discussing together, Jesus himself caught up with them and was already accompanying them. But their eyes were held so that they did not recognize him. So Jesus comes and joins them and is walking along with them, and they did not recognize him. Sometimes Jesus is in our midst, and we don't recognize that he's there. We don't recognize it, either by our spirit, by the witness of our spirit, or by the faith that we have in the word of God, or by the fact that the word says, lo, I am here, I'll be with you always. He would be with us every time, every time we come together and everywhere we go. And so there they were talking, and Jesus comes up with them, and he says to them, <clears throat> what is this discussion <clears throat> that you are exchanging and throwing back and forth <clears throat> between yourselves as you walk along? <clears throat> Excuse me. And they stood still, looking sad and downcast. Then one of them, named Cleophas, answered him, Do you alone dwell as a stranger in Jerusalem and not know the things that have occurred there in these days? I mean, like, what are you, stupid? Right? This is the Lord they're talking to. But they can't perceive it. And he said to them, Oh, what kind of things? And they said to him, about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in work and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and others gave him up to be sentenced to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem and set Israel free. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things occurred. Moreover, some women of our company astounded us and drove us out of our senses. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and they didn't find his body. And they returned saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. So some of those who were with us went to the tomb, 
And they found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. So this is what they're pondering and they're talking about as they're going along. Now they're bringing him up to date. And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones, sluggish of mind and dull of perception and slow of heart, to believe, to trust in and rely on everything that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary and essentially fitting that the Christ, the Messiah, should suffer all these things before entering into his glory, his majesty, and his splendor? Then beginning with Moses and throughout all the prophets, he went on explaining and interpreting to them in all the scriptures the things concerning and referring to himself. Now, he is opening up the scriptures to them. There is a life-giving thing happening here, and yet they still don't know who he is. They still don't comprehend who he is. Now, you would think to themselves, they would have said, this, this man seems very well educated about the things that have been going on. Maybe he really was there. Or how can he know all of these things? Who is this guy? Wouldn't you think they would think to themselves that way? And it says, Then when they drew near the village to which they were going, he acted as if he would go no further. But they urged and insisted, saying to him, Remain with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And it occurred that as he reclined at table with them, he took a loaf of bread and praised God and gave thanks and asked a blessing and then broke it and was giving it to them. When their eyes were instantly opened and they clearly recognized him and he vanished, he departed invisibly. Everything is easy to get when you're thinking about it in retrospect. Now they've just had this experience with the risen Christ. Jesus, who rose from the dead, is walking along the road with them. And that's not the only place that we find him on this evening of the resurrection day, on the, the night of the first day. And so, just, just to poke this in, it's, it's no wonder that Christians worship on the Sunday or the first day of the week because God manifested his glory by raising Jesus from the dead on that day and he continued all day long didn't he he continued all day long to manifest or show himself forth to those who would see him and even those who couldn't see him he would supernaturally open their eyes so they I think that's that is so encouraging to us if we cannot see him, don't worry. He's going to come and he's going to open our eyes so we can see him. He's going to not leave us in the dark because he is the light. And so we find in this place that then when they saw him, he vanished. And they said to each other, verse 32, were not our hearts really moved and burning within us while he was talking on us with the road? And as he, as he opened and explained to us the the sense of the scriptures, in retrospect, they could see, but while it was happening, they were totally immune to it. They were totally unable to perceive it. Do you see what I'm saying? And yet, so often we are gathering information, always gathering information. They were gathering information, but they rejected it because they couldn't believe it. And they rejected it because they couldn't believe it. And here this man comes up and he starts walking with him. And it's inconceivable to them that that could be the Lord Jesus. It's totally inconceivable. And yet here's a man that knows all the scriptural references. He knows everything the prophets said. He knows all of the uh, things that have been fulfilled out of the mouths of prophets in the last three days. And he knows it all and he's telling them these things. And in retrospect, they say, oh, my goodness. That's why we felt like we did. But why, when we felt like we did, could we not see it was him? Do you understand what I'm trying to exposit here to, to say? Are we dull of hearing? Have we become so, what would you say, um, jaded 
about the miracles and the things of God. I mean, God wants us to be able to, to flow with him and to move with him. And I'll admit, it can be a struggle, a struggle to speak for God, a struggle to preach the word for God, because we have a battle going on, a battle that is between our thinking and the enemy who doesn't want us to think about these things and receive revelation. And so, uh, verse 33 says, Rising up in that very hour, they went back to Jerusalem. Now they got a, I don't know, seven-mile walk now, right? Well, what time is it? It's late in the day. How long does it take to walk seven miles? How much? About two and a half hours. Okay, two and a half hours. So they've just had dinner, and they're, they're heading back to Jerusalem because something happened. Something happened. And so they went back to Jerusalem where they found the 11 apostles gathered together and those who were with them. Who said the Lord really has arisen and appeared to Simon Peter? So he appeared to the women, Mary Magdalene. He hadn't appeared to the women. The angels appeared to the women, but he appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to the men on the road. He appeared to Simon Peter. He was very busy, wasn't he? On this day, would you say he was busy? He was revealing himself as risen from the dead, as alive eternally. And so they related to them in full, verse 35, what had happened on the road and how he was known and recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. Now, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself took his stand among them and said to them, Peace! Would that blow your minds? What if Jesus just right here in the middle of us? What would y'all do? I don't believe it. <laughs> We're all hallucinating. I don't believe it. That would be really, he just, Jesus appeared. He took his stand among them and he said, peace, freedom from all the stresses that are experienced as a result of sin be to you. And they were so startled and terrified that they thought they saw a ghost, a spirit. They were, it says terrified. That's not just scared. They were terrified. Now, this is stuff has been going on all day long. They've had reports from here, reports from there. They have disregarded this one. They've disregarded that one. They've disregarded this. Well, maybe Simon Peter said something about it. But what? There's Jesus right in their midst. Boom. And they are terrified. They just cannot comprehend it. And he said to them in verse 38, Why are you disturbed and troubled? And why do such doubts and questionings arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet as I myself feel and handle me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. He's saying, I am not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. You don't need to be afraid of me. Look at me. It's me. See the nail prints in my hands and my feet? Don't you remember this from a few days ago? Feel and handle me, he says. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while, since they still could not believe it, for sheer joy and marvel, he said to them, Did y'all have anything to eat? So he was hungry. And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it, and he ate it before him. Now this is, this is so important because he is risen from the dead, but he is not a ghost. He is not a phantom. He is a person who still eats. And he says here, feel and handle me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, such as you see that I have. What does he leave out there? Blood. blood. He leaves out the blood, doesn't he? So here is a, is Jesus, flesh and bones, no blood, eating food. 
Now, what does that do to your brain? <laughs> right? I mean, if you, if you try to resist it, it would probably overwhelm you. And then he said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. This is what I told you when I was still with you. Click in to what I have already told you. Click into the words that I already said that you remembered. Click in to what has been brought to you and what I have said to you. And everything which was written concerning me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he thoroughly opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So he had a little key, click, or something. He went in there, and he had to open their minds. Ah. The opening of our minds by God is a supernatural miracle because we can't perceive these things really in, the, in our flesh and in our mind with the battle going on. But God is able to open our thinking, take us out of our binocular vision and open our thinking to where all of a sudden the whole thing of history, all the prophetic words come together and then they were being able to understand the scriptures. Now, we who live in this time, which is uh, over 2,000 years after the cross, what we are seeing is we still don't get this tracking together. Or else, if we do, we are hesitant at speaking it out. Verse 46, he says, And he said to them, Thus it was, written that Christ the Messiah should suffer and on the third day should rise from the dead. Hosea 6.2 is a reference. And that repentance with a view to and a condition of forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So he begins to instruct them. He reminds them, he opens their thinking, and he instructs them what they are supposed to do. He says, you are witnesses of these things. You just saw it. You've got to believe it. You have to see it because if you see it and you believe it, then you can be a witness. You can't be a witness of something you don't see, can you? No. You can hear what everybody else tells you. That's hearsay. But in a court of law, that's not acceptable, hearsay. But if you see it with your own eyeballs and you see it with your own thinking, the interesting thing is that if we were all here to see an accident happen, we would all see it differently. We would all have a different report of it, wouldn't we? Because one person would be seeing one thing and another person would be seeing another thing. But what they're seeing makes them witnesses. When you collect all of their statements, you should have the full story. We have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Of these all, who was there when Jesus was crucified? John. Interesting. Of this of the of the synoptic, what they call synoptic gospels or the stereo gospels. So verse 49 says. And behold, I will send forth upon you what my Father has promised, but remain in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. Now you can see here he didn't even speak of the Holy Spirit just in Acts chapter 1 and 2, but he spoke of it in Luke chapter 24. And then he conducted them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he invoked a blessing upon them. He blessed them. And it occurred that while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was taken up into heaven. And they worshipped him, went back to Jerusalem with great joy, and they were continually in the temple celebrating with praises and blessing and extolling God. So be it. Now would you say they already believed now? They finally believed? Do you think they believed finally? Do you think they finally believed? Do you think all of them finally believed? You think all of them finally believed? Okay, I kind of contend with you. Uh, I mean, I agree with you. Yeah, because uh, it's in our nature to be suspicious sometimes. 
It's in our nature. Even when we have a miraculous manifestation or, or showing forth of, of God in our midst, that we look at it and we just walk out and sometimes we forget it. Sometimes we don't understand it, so we just disengage from it and let it go. But here in this picture, in Luke 24, we've got a picture of him doing a lot of different things that day, don't we? He just wasn't raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost, but he began to appear to his disciples. He began to make himself known among those who followed him. He began to teach them, and he was able to open their thinking in a supernatural way to help them to grab on to this that was so important because he says, you are witnesses of these things. You are the, you're the, I'm leaving it in, you in charge of it all. That's what he's saying. I'm leaving you in charge of it all. But you got to wait in Jerusalem till you get the power, till you get the power. So let's go over to John. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 20. And John says many things in this chapter, verse chapter 20, of things that went on that day, but particularly to us right now. It says, verse 19, Then on the same day of the week, when it was evening, though the disciples were behind closed doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace to you. So saying, he showed them his hands and his side. And when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy, ecstasy, exultation, ecstasy, delight. And then Jesus said to them, Peace to you, just as the Father has sent me forth, so I am sending you. And having said this to them, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now having received the Holy Spirit, and being led and directed by him, if you forgive the sins of anyone, and they are forgiven, if you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. And so we see him now in this particular thing. He's instructing them. He's teaching them. He's giving them authority, isn't he? He's sending them forth to do a job. And this is all on the evening of the first day of his resurrection. I think it is so um, encouraging. I think it's so comforting because we are so like those disciples that we should be easier on ourselves and recognize that the Lord, he's trying to get things into us, past our thinking, into our mind, deep in our mind where we can begin to receive it in our spirit. You see, we, we, we hear, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We hear things, and then we have to digest them. It's just like if you eat pot roast for dinner. You're going to have the vegetables and all of those things, and you eat it, but then you're going to have to digest it, aren't you? No, you're going to take some time, and it has to digest for it to go into your body and give you nutrients and things that you need, vitamins and all of those things that are necessary for your growth and your health. So it takes digestion. So when we hear the word and faith cometh by hearing, we have to digest it. It has to go from our intellectual perspective to our spirit. And this is a difference. You can know what the word of God says, but if it never becomes life to you, then it's not going to be helpful to you in, in the realm of the supernatural, in the realm of the spirit. And it's an interesting thing. What you have experienced in your life, as God has worked in your life, that becomes not logos, which is the written word, but as it becomes manifest in your life, it becomes the rima. Rima is the made real. The rima is the... The word made real, it's, it's being digested in us. It's becoming a reality in us. And those are the things where we will have 
certain greater authority to minister forth to others. And, and it's very interesting that the Lord takes in our lives the things that we think are inconsequential, and because of those things, he can wrap it up and make it a super weapon of mass destruction for the enemy. And so it was here in these appearances that he made. He did not do these for a lark. He did not do these for fun. He didn't do this to scare them and they go, I just really fooled them. Now, he didn't do it for that. He had a purpose for every word he said. He had a purpose for everything he did. He had a purpose because he was entrusting to them, first of all, the... Uh, verse 21 says, I'm sending you forth as the Father sent me forth. So this is a, this is a very important... Uh, what would you call it? A um, when you well, like the British would knight somebody, or you would appoint somebody, or you'd make the commissioning. Thank you. Yeah, he's commissioning them to do a certain job, and in that certain job, he has power to help them do it. He tells them to wait for the power, but he's planning all of this very meticulously to see that they have what they need to do to follow through on what they have just seen. And I will tell you, we are the same. He has commissioned us with the same things that he has commissioned them with, and we are his disciples, and he is sending us, has sent us. We were born again. We become sent into the world, sending you into the world. And then he, what does it say, breathed on them, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I feel in my heart that this is where they were born again. This is where they believed on Jesus. This is where they received the regenerating seed of the Holy Spirit, and they became born again. But they were to wait for the power or the infilling of the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and we see in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, then it put everything together and began to, to make a, a, uh, a formidable power structure here for God to be able to work through. Now, I will tell you, this is so powerful that the Bible tells us that if, if the devil had known what he was doing, he would have never crucified the Lord of glory because what he did was he crucified him and upsprang many like him. Many like him and we are like him born again into the reality of the kingdom of heaven even while walking on this earth we have authority and we can work the works of God and preach the word of God and tell what we see we must be careful we don't get into unbelief we must be careful that we don't just let things certain things slide uh, certain things take us over and we go I can't believe that for example if you were going to pray for somebody to be healed and they get healed and you say I can't believe that well that's not a very good thing we should be saying just as I thought that's what I expected amen that's what I expected we don't always know what we're expecting but by faith we do these things because Jesus said that we should do these things so he is equipping us he has equipped us and he is continuing to equip us and so he's going to use us. The word tonight said, don't be afraid. Don't walk in fear that God is going to uh, clear away the cobwebs from our brain. He's got a plan and he's got a purpose. He's going to take the river and he's going to rush through and get rid of all the debris that's, that's stacked up there for who knows how long and begin to then bring forth a crop a powerful crop in our lives of the word that's been sown in our lives. And so I can, I can honestly say, because I'm a great nagger on the fact that everybody should read their Bible through in a year, and yet I find myself giving out maybe two or three certificates at the end of the year or any certain time during the year. And 
We need to apply ourselves to this so we can walk in the authority and that we can walk in the uh, knowledge of the Word of God. I mean, the Holy Spirit, he tells us in John chapters 14, 15, 16, that the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance everything that Jesus has said to us. So if we put it in, the Holy Spirit will bring it to our remembrance. He will open our minds like Jesus did with the disciples. He'll open our minds and he'll bring it to our remembrance and it'll all go together so we have a comprehensive understanding of it. I want to tell you something. I don't want any doctor working on me that does not have a comprehensive understanding and experience in what he's doing. Do you? I mean, please. They're all practicing physicians, and I appreciate that, and I love doctors. I'm a registered nurse. I, I understand the whole thing, but I am saying I don't want the resident. I want the guy that's been there for 20 years doing this. That's what I want. I want the guy that can I can have a little, perhaps, um, confidence in. And so we need to consider these things. As, as, as we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, things are going to happen in our lives and the lives of others. And I, uh, I'm, I, I, think, I think of these things because when I was first born again, or before I got born again, I was delivered of a demon. And I, over the telephone, and the lady that prayed for me, she just said over the phone, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. Now, I don't know what she expected to happen, but I didn't expect what happened to happen because I didn't even know I had a demon. And when I felt it leave me, well, that was a miracle. That was a total miracle in my life. And then I got into this word and I found out this is normal Christian life. This is normal. So we should want the word. We shouldn't have to be nagged to read the word. We should want the word any way we can get it in. If you can't read, listen to it. There's any number of ways to get it. And there's even comic book uh, Bibles that you can look at that. And that's, it's excellent too. That doesn't hurt. But just get the word in so it can be brought into this place to where you can access it and walk out on the authority of it and be strengthened by it. These disciples were so strengthened by their meetings. Now, this wasn't the only meetings that they had. This was the first day after the resurrection. The Bible goes on to say that Jesus kept appearing to them for 40 days. He kept coming back to them and speaking to them and having fellowship with them. He didn't leave them alone. He kept teaching them. He kept working with them. He kept being there. And then on the 50th day, what happened? The Holy Spirit was poured out in the city of Jerusalem. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon those 120 in the upper room, to my thinking, there should have been 500 or 1,000 or more than that. But you see, we lose track of the miracles. We lose track of the things that were, that, that were so great. We lose track of those things. We've got to keep those things in our memories. We've got to keep the miracles. I have never forgotten how it felt to be delivered from that demon. I have never forgotten how it felt to be born again. And I will keep it right on the tip of my nose so I can see it at all times because it encourages me. It encourages me to keep going, to keep chasing after, to keep knowing that God is God and that God's going to do what he says he's going to do, that he's able to do all things, and that he would even use me. Do you know how precious it is to have God speak tongues and interpretation in a, in a meeting? How precious it is that, that God would speak to us we are a small group, and yet he loves us. He has a plan and a purpose for us. There are things that we are going to be about and to be doing, and he's in, going to encourage us, and he's bringing us through this. Uh, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We always seem to get scared, but don't be afraid. Don't be terrified. It's me. 
See? Feel me. Touch me, he said. He's that close that we can have that kind of a relationship with him. So I want you to know that it might be something to do for your own private devotions between now and, and Pentecost is to go through and examine what he did with these in the next 40 days. I, I can't tell you how much I wanted to preach chapter 21 to you, my favorite chapter, where I got called into the ministry. But that will come, but that was another time. It was another time in the 40 days when Jesus came to his disciples and he began to direct them and, and work with them. And as he came to them, he will come to you because he is no respecter of persons. He is not constrained by time now. He is not constrained by uh, the uh, events going on in the world. He can show himself sovereignly to the, to the Islamic people, to the, uh, anybody that he wants. He can do that, but he really would like to use you and I to do that, to be witnesses. He said he gave us the Holy Spirit to be witnesses, that we would have power to be witnesses, that we could tell what we know, we can tell what we've seen, we can tell what healing we got. We can, this is why we know what we know what we know. Amen? That's why we know. Why do you know? It's what you experienced, isn't it? Some of you are in the experiencing zone. I think we're all in the experiencing zone. We are learning by what we are experiencing now because things happen all the time to bring us closer to the Lord. Circumstance, time, chance, it all happens to all men, but for us it's used for a greater purpose. Amen? To draw us closer to him, to empower us to do the work that Jesus called us to do. So, Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us comfortless. You sent the Holy Spirit to us. We thank you for the blood of Jesus that was gathered up somehow and presented on the mercy seat in heaven as an atoning sacrifice for our sins that we might go free. That Jesus took our infirmities. He took our pains upon himself, our sorrows, our griefs, our mistakes and he bore all of that that we might walk without it and we thank you for this great resurrection day Lord I'd like to know more about it I'd like to know more of what it means and I know that you will as time goes on show that to us as we walk with you and talk with you and listen to you and pay attention and we thank you for it join us for services at wellspring church of all nations a dynamic church that lifts up the name of jesus we are meeting at 4870 janelle drive located between buffalo and durango with an entrance at 8140 west lone mountain road our focus is to win the lost, connect them to Jesus and his church, train them in the word of God, and help them find their place in the work of the Lord. Our service times are 10.45 a.m. and 6 p.m. on Sunday and 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-631-5027. That's 631-5027. Or you can visit our website, www.wellspringministries.com.